selves for the moment will be good. And then, as I say, um, Jim has been leading this effort uh, to, to discover and, and to publish the names, I, I guess they know the names, of about 1,339 people who are buried in a pauper's plot in the Catholic section of the Evergreen Cemetery. Um, he'll speak tonight to us about that journey of, that the immigrants went on, many of them, of course, great hunger, refugees. And so, you know, as we know, on average, famine refugees lived for about seven years after they reached America. Not all of them, of course, but, you know, many of them did not go on to have a, a great and long, happy life here because they had been so badly affected by malnourishment, etc., at home. And then not sometimes not great uh, working opportunities here in America. So he will talk to us about that. And as I say, he's the Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Colorado in Denver. I'm delighted to welcome him to Albany. Um, and I hope we'll have a good event. He's very good for putting up with us. We're practically underwater <laughs> down here. So there's fans and dehumidifiers and everything in the background. It's a very uh, casual event tonight is what I would say. But welcome everyone. Thank you very much. And I'll turn you over now to Dr. Jim, James Walsh. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for putting this together on such short notice. And after a flood has <laughs> ravaged the museum as well, so I'm so grateful for Elizabeth for her perseverance. And um, I'll say a few short words about why I'm here and what I'm doing, and then I want to go right into the presentation. And I want to make sure I'm leaving time for discussion, as every time I do a presentation, the dialogue at the end is always the most beneficial. So um, <clears throat> so I, I just finished a five-day cycling tour from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Albany. And so I've gone through some areas of the country that have rich, deep history of Irish labor, the anthracite coal region, and of course the Erie Canal and, and everything in between. And along the way, I've raised money for a memorial that's being worked on as we speak in a cemetery in the town of Leadville, Colorado. Um, Leadville is the um, highest elevation of any town in uh, North America, 10,200 feet. And it's the site of one of the largest silver rushes in North American history that happened beginning in about 1878. Um, in, in really declining in the 1890s. And so um, Leadville had really the largest Irish community between the West Coast and the Midwest during the 1880s. And the percentage of Leadville that was Irish was close to 20%. So it was very heavily Irish town per capita and was also in terms of just sheer numbers. So this is a this is an important place um, for Irish American history in general. And, but what I'll be talking about today is a little bit of that history, but really the memorial that's being worked on today as we speak. And, and um, if any of you are interested in contributing to the fundraiser, I, I need to somehow get you the link. Maybe um, we can post that somehow on the chat um, during the talk tonight. So anyway, thanks for being being here virtually, everyone. It's, it's um, it's fun to be in Albany, and it's great to be at the Irish American Heritage Museum giving this talk. This is a thrill for me. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to share my screen, and then, we'll, and then I, I want to be sure that I finish around, you know, by eight o'clock, so that we have time to open this up and just have some dialogue and discussion. Um, by the way, I just want to make a quick note, Elizabeth, since you're watching. I've, I've had in the past issues where this, my screen changes, but people watching their screen does not with the slides. So for some reason, your, the slides aren't changing for you. Please let me know. I will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'll begin here with the. Just an image of the cemetery. This is <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the pauper section in the back of Evergreen Cemetery in Leadville. Um, you can see the graves, the sunken graves there. I want to point out that 
this is 10,200 feet. This is snow covered for most of the year. So um, roughly mid-October to November all the way until sometime in April, uh, late April, this is, this is covered in snow, um, which, which, which is really part of the reason why I believe it's, it was so hidden and unknown for so long. I mean, locals have, have always known about this part of the cemetery, but perhaps its historic value hasn't been realized until, until now. So what you're seeing are rows of sunken graves um, that stretch for acres through the pine forest. At the time of the burials, the, the um, area was cleared, but trees have since grown up around them. Um, they were marked at burial. So there were, there were these, these sort of crude wooden markers that the, the name of the person buried were et, was etched into, and they've since rotted and crumbled, and they're unreadable. So all we have now are, are these rows of, of sunken graves. Um, in the Catholic section, there are around 2,000. No one really knows how many, and it's impossible to count. Um, everyone I've spoken to who has any knowledge about this says the same thing that the records are incomplete we don't know how many but the records give us 1339 names of people in unmarked graves um, we have names and ages and so that it's clear from the names that the vast majority are irish i estimate three quarters um, could be you know higher or lower um, most of them Irish immigrants, and the people buried here were buried between 1879 and about <clears throat> 1892. So that 13 year period is when these burials took place. Um, and that gives you an idea of how massive the town was. The town went from about 200 before the silver rush. It was, it was a kind of a forgotten gold mining camp. And by 1880, by the mid 1880s, there were some estimates as high as 40,000 people in, in packed into the town and surrounding gulches. Um, and the east side of Leadville was was the Irish side. So this became um, a, a, a destination for people traveling across the country. Um, uh, Anyone with any sort of business with Irish nationalism causes or labor organizing made their way to Leadville. Oscar Wilde spoke there um, at the Tabor Opera House to a packed house of you know, mostly minors. His topic was um, eth um, aesthetics and the ethics of art. And he was said to have gone into the matchless mine with some minors afterward to drink whiskey. He emerged and said to a reporter, I had three three course meal. The first was whiskey, the second whiskey, and the third whiskey. <laughs> and said to have outdrank the miners. Um, Michael Davitt visited Leadville twice, the uh, of the of the Irish Land League. Um, and, and and many others. Um, John L. Sullivan, the bare knuckle boxer, fought twice in Leadville. So this was a destination, this was a place that they that, the more money was raised for the Irish Land League in the early 1880s, according to um, numbers that I, that I found, um, than, it, than anywhere with the exception of New York City or Chicago. So, um, so Leadville was a very important place just in terms of Irish culture and, and community in general. Here's some other photos of the, of the graves. I want to I want to say that the average, you know, I, I was interested in what Elizabeth said in the introduction when she mentioned um, that the average Irish immigrant only lived, I think she said, seven years in the United States. And um, uh, <clears throat> I have a pair of headphones. I might grab those because it's going to help with the audio. Give me mm -hmm. one brief second. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
There, is that better, everyone? Audio better? Okay, great. Um, so the average age of the people buried in these unmarked graves is 22 or 23. And half of them are children. So half of them are under 18. Uh, something like 45% of them are 12 and under. Uh, so those numbers really, I, I think, say so much about the quality of life and the realities of life at 10,000 feet. And I don't think this is just about Leadville's altitude. This is really about mining camps in general. And, and the Irish occupy the bottom rung of the social ladder in Leadville. Uh, other photo. I have some folks here who can't see the images, so I'm trying, I'm trying to to fill in the. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. There are some markers. Some families have done the research <coughs> and found their loved one and put a, put a stone in it sometime over the past century. And we, we believe when the memorial goes in with the names and that we're going to see this accelerate and more and more stones. And this is, a, this is of course, what we want. We want the, the unnamed to be named. So um, this is, we expect that this, the whole terrain will change drastically with the memorial. Um, so I want to tell a story about the memorial. I'll continue to weave in the story of the Leadville Irish, the history of it. Um, <clears throat> so four years ago, a friend of mine contacted me and he said, you know that cemetery in Leadville, Jim? I said, yeah. I said, the Irish government needs to know about this. <laughs> we, need to, we need to let them know. They, they, they need to be. So I, I didn't think the Irish government would care much about a cemetery in Leadville, but he emailed the consular general and copied me on the email. It was one of those emails I did not want to be CC'd on because <laughs> it was quite aggressive, uh, <laughs> demanding that the consular general get, get, get himself up to Leadville. And, well, he, it worked. And he showed up a few months later and was very were impacted by the, by the experience of being there at the graves, as I was 18 years ago. And when I left the for, for the first time, I, I just I left with a feeling that I had a responsibility that the, the voices of the people, um, the, I, I would, I would um, do what I could to make those voices heard. So he was, he was amazing. Adrian Farrell. I've, wherever you are, Adrian, thank you. He has done so much and um, set in motion a process whereby we've we've um, secured a couple of heritage grants from the Irish government. Two years ago, Irish Ambassador Mahal visited, and he and his wife. We were able to escort them through the graves. They were both very impacted as well. And so our greatest supporter has been the Irish government. Um, and I've learned a lot, you know, just about the importance of the diaspora within the Irish government. And, and that's, that's meant a lot to me. You know, the, what inspired me to do this work is, is that I think I have 11 or so great, great or two or three greats Irish ancestors who were famine refugees. And, um, you know, they, they did railroad work, they did factory and mine work, domestic work, you know, the, the hardest jobs. And I, I, but I never knew that. I never knew anything about it. I just knew I was Irish. So when I became a graduate student, I started researching my own roots. And the more I found about um, that their work and their labor and the hardships they faced, the more I felt like I, I was grounded, I knew who I was. And so when it came time to choose a dissertation topic, I started looking around in Colorado and everything pointed toward, toward uh, Leadville. Two of my great, great grandparents were killed by trains when they were crossing train yards. 
they got crushed between cars. My, um, one of them somehow held on for three days. My great grandfather was a brakeman on the train and he was thrown off the train one day and nearly was crushed, was beneath the wheels. So, um, industrial accidents and, and, and all of that was, is, is a big part of my own uh, ancestral history. And that's why I do this work. The Irish did the, the worst industrial labor. So I'd like to point to that cemetery and say the people buried there are victims of a different kind of war. Mm -hmm. They left a war of occupation and they joined a war of industrial labor. And, though, and we don't honor the victims of that war as much as we should. So the memorial is the spirit of that, is the spirit of turning to the war of industrial labor that so many thousands of victims lie in unmarked graves particularly Irish for the 19th century. I think, it's, it, I think it, it has to be mentioned as well that we can't honor 19th century immigrants without honoring 21st century immigrants and using the stories of hardship from the 19th century to ask important questions about why immigrants today are, are treated in the way that they are and maybe find a little solidarity with this memorial. So this is an Irish memorial, but it's, a, it's I think, first a human rights memorial. And that's, that's how I like to look at it and how I like to frame it. So anyway, this is a picture of the St. Patrick's Practice Parade. Uh, Elizabeth, are the slides changing? OK. Yeah. <laughs> they have this parade in September in Leadville. They have a parade in March, but you can imagine the ice and snow. <laughs> so September is much nicer. They call it the, the Practice Parade. And, and they marched on Main Street. Well, well they, co they, they delayed the parade when Adrian Farrell was in town to coincide with his visit. So they delayed the parade two weeks so that he could, they, and it was a beautiful September day, and they put him in an old antique fire truck. And here he is. He didn't know what to do. He, should I wave or what? <laughs> he was treated as like a... A, uh, it, was, it was as if a, a president of, a, of another nation was in town. Leadville, Leadville really you know, rolled out the red carpet. And here we are in the cemetery. Um, we had a ceremony. We had some speeches. Um, someone hired a bagpiper, and, and, they, and they sent them way deep into the forest, which was a really amazing noise, just a beautiful noise. Um, and uh, it was a beautiful day, just a beautiful, beautiful day for Leadville. Here's the uh, Adrian on the right in the green tie. Um, I'm still in touch with him. He's still doing what he can. And then the red tie is Ambassador Mahal, who's been a, a, a great advocate for this project and really gets the spirit of it. I mean, this is this is not about celebrating the the Irish who have climbed the ladder and, 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 and found financial and polit political success. This is really about turning the camera to those who, who, who suffered the most. And, and as Elizabeth said, you know, the, the orphans are the famine who didn't live long in this country. And there, there's a lot of work now being done around intergenerational trauma of the, of the famine. And, and uh, I've noticed in my trips to Ireland that it's not something that people are comfortable to be talking about even 150 years later. So I think this memorial will inspire more dialogue, more conversation about descendants and how, how this is still kind of embedded in, 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 in the descendants of this, of this moment. So, and, and the rest of the folks are the people from the planning committee. The Irish Network of Colorado has been a great champion of the of the project locally and the guy in the yellow tie in the back is the mayor of Leadville by the way the um, I should mention that the town of Allahees in West Cork on the tip of the Barra Peninsula is now twinning with Leadville because I discovered in the in the church records that a third of the Leadville Irish came from Cork and and that was because the copper mines there were were and there was a, a sort of a mini famine in the, in the late 1870s that drove people out. And many of them, hundreds, went to Butte and Leadville. I'm going to skip through some of this and go to, um, I want to mention the labor movement in Leadville. Um, 
In 1880, 5,000 miners walked out of the silver mines in May. Right around this time, it was late May. Um, it wasn't spontaneous completely. They had been meeting and planning. They knew, they knew an action was coming. They just didn't know exactly when. Their issues were they wanted to go from a 10 to an eight hour day. They wanted a raise from $3 a day to $4 a day. They wanted better safety codes, and they wanted the right to form a union. And so when they were given an order that they could no longer talk on the job, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And that was the trigger that started the, the strike in motion. Um, they walked out of them, an all-day walkout. They went from mine to mine. Many of these mines are named after Irish patriots. There's the O'Donovan Rasa, the Robert Emmett, and on and on. It took all day, but 5,000 miners then paraded down Main Street in silence. Um, and it was a declaration that, that they were, weren't going to put up with the conditions anymore. They appointed a young man named Michael Mooney, 28 years old, as the leader. He was from Dublin. Um, not a whole lot's known about his past, except he had been in the U.S. seven years. And he was deeply respected by the miners, and he was even respected by the company, um, who, who uh, knew him to be an honest, straight shooter and, and uh, a very tough guy. So he became the appointed leader. Um, the business community in Leadville Valley used their leverage to convince the governor that this was a, a violent uprising. The Rocky Mountain News headline read, the Molly Maguires have taken control of Colorado in large letter, letter type. So sensational news uh, he headlines like that. After, three, after, after just a week, the governor declared martial law. The minor, the, not a single act of violence had taken place. But the governor declared martial law, sent in um, hundreds of Colorado National Guards troops whose orders were to arrest striking miners on vagrancy laws and force them to work in chain gangs, building roads. So Mooney went to, went to Denver. He was, he was under threat from vigilantes. All over the Rocky Mountain West, um, there were vigilante groups that were anti-Irish Catholic, similar to the American Protective Association. And, um, and uh, they were threatening to lynch Mooney, so union members would surround his cabin every night to keep him safe. Well, he went to Denver to get donations from the, um, from the workers in Denver, and he gave a big speech in downtown Denver. And, and uh, the Denver police arrested him after the speech. But the next day he was released because they couldn't hold him. He hadn't committed a crime. Um, but the strike was a, was a lost cause with the military occupation. Mooney um, was blacklisted. All the leadership was blacklisted. He stayed in Denver for, or, I'm sorry, in Leadville for a few more years. Um, married um, Sarah, um, oh gosh, Gil Gallen from um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, the anthracite region. Her father was a coal miner from Sligo. And they had seven kids eventually. They, they, they drifted west. They went to Seattle. And then he went, ended up in Butte, a copper miner for a while. And then Los Angeles. He lived two decades, his last years in Los Angeles. And that sort of embodies the Irish in the west, drifting, wandering, lost, in hopes of a stable and fair existence. Um, so I, um, I, I, I use Mooney's life as sort of a, a, a microcosm of the Irish in the West in general. I've even, I've even been to his uh, grave site. <laughs> and um, so, so uh, and um, I, I gave this talk to a genealogy society once, and I, I mentioned how I'd be interested in meeting his descendants. And a woman came up to me and said, I'll find them. And she emailed me two days later with the name and number of Mooney's only living grandchild, 92-year-old Marilyn Mooney. <laughs> so I called her. <laughs> and it took her a while to, um, to 
understand why this man she's speaking to knew everything about her grandfather. <laughs> and 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 then and I sent her, you know, my writing, and and we're now friends. And but I, what I suspected was true. She didn't know a thing about her grandfather except that he was a miner. Had no idea about the strike and what he had done. And I think that's an example of how there is a kind of ostracism that comes with doing something as bold as he did. Um, and he didn't want his children and grandchildren to feel like second-class citizens that he was made to feel. So the oral, oral tradition wasn't shared, wasn't passed down. So the, Mo the Mooney story is a fascinating story, and i uh, hoping to get Marilyn to the celebration we're having in September of the memorial. Here I am at the St. Patrick's practice parade on the right dressed as Michael Mooney. <laughs> oh, I didn't mention that I, I've been... I've been uh, dressing up as him for 15 years and giving monologues, historical monologues, in schools and churches and wherever will have me. I almost did it today, but I don't have my costume. <laughs> this is the only photo ever I found in Butte, Montana, in the newspaper archive. The family doesn't even have a picture of him. This is the only photo of him that I've ever been able to find. And here's a picture of some striking Irish miner. They always wore ribbons. One of the secret societies in Ireland was called the Ribbon Men. And so um, this just kind of gives you a visual of what, of what their parades, their marches must have looked like. Annunciation Church in Leadville, this is, they like to say, it's the highest church in the Catholic order. <laughs> um, built in 1880 by crumpled wages of miners. Um, Father Henry Robinson, um, Irish priest, started the church and also started Annunciation Church in Denver, which has the same exact architecture in northeast Denver. Um, you can see uh, the Mount Massive behind it, um, aptly named, and this is, gives you a little bit of an idea of what the, of what the space looks like, surrounded by 14,000 foot peaks. This is just a map to highlight how the east side of Leadville was was the Irish side, and the, especially Sixth Street. They called everyone on Sixth Street the Sixth Street Irish. Here's just a. I'm, I'm not going to give you too many graphs and charts. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but this is. I wanted to. This is just a snapshot of the ethnic groups in 1880. Um, it's a little misleading given that the Canadians, so many of them are Irish Canadians. So they could have been in either column. And then the English are, are predominantly Cornish. So um, it's a, but other than that, you can see that this is really Northern and Western European. That, that begins to change in the 1890s to Eastern and Southern European. But at this time, it's overwhelmingly Northern and Western European. I'll say this too, that the reason there's no Chinese listed is that the Chinese were banned from living in Leadville. They were, they were banned. There was a ban on the Chinese. So um, there were a couple of, um, of uh, stories from newspaper accounts of Chinese families trying to move or Chinese miners trying to move into town or work the mines and they were violently uh, driven away. So that's a, that, that's a part of the Leadville story that needs to be told as well. And the Irish contributed to that anti-Chinese sentiment as well. Um, I did a surname search, just compared the Bear Peninsula surnames to the Leadville surname, and found that they were really largely very similar. Um, again, just solidifying the, the fact that so many of the Leadville Irish came from the West Cork. Um, by the way, there's there's 50 some Sullivans that'll be on the on the memorial. <clears throat> Again, the the Cork um, representation uh, beyond any other, well beyond any other county. You can see from the both the both the marriage and the baptism records that it's just overwhelmingly a Cork population. They they called the Corkonians would come storming into town from the east side on Friday nights to, to drink, and they called them the Utes because they, they made this whooping sound on their way into town. <clears throat> okay, um, in, in terms of the U.S.-born Irish in Leadville, um, 
New York and Pennsylvania were the overwhelming um, origins of, of the U.S. born. The Pennsylvanians were not coming from Philly and Pittsburgh. They were overwhelmingly from the anthracite region. So there was even a gulch outside of Leadville that was nicknamed Lackawanna Gulch after Lackawanna County. So that was that's another that's the reason I did my bike tour through the anthracite region is um, you know just to solidify that connection and and the newspapers in Colorado were so quick to label these guys Molly Maguires. It was it was almost instinctual. Any labor dispute in the 19th century Colorado that was Irish led, they had to bear that label. That was going to be automatic, automatic label. Um, but there's such a strong connection to the anthracite region, and and so what one of my students did is, <clears throat> she got a list of all the people who were prosecuted for alleged Molly activity in Pennsylvania several hundred names. And she started searching for those names in Leadville City Directory and Census. And she found several. Um, and so what we've, what we've discovered is that many, when the, when the Irish were driven from the anthracite region around the time of the hangings, the hangings were in 1877, 78. That's exactly when the Leadville boom started. So the timing meant that Many of the Irish driven out of the anthracite region made their way to Leadville. And so um, there's a, in, in the unmarked section, one of the only markers is to um, a man who says on the marker, the, the self proclaimed king of Leadville. And um, his name's escaping me right now, but he was imprisoned in Pennsylvania for alleged Molly activity. Uh, so she, she's discovered it, and the Pinkertons followed them. They followed them to Colorado. Um, McParlin, James McParlin ran the Pinkerton Agency in Denver, and they were hunted essentially. Um, many of them um, changed their names. Um, the man who I just told you about with the marker, he changed his last name to Frenny for, for many years before um, changing it back. So that's, a, that's an untold chapter that's going that's will be written about soon. Um, let me just jump to the well. Some of the some of the uh, occupations um, for uh, Irish-born people in Leadville in 1880. You can see for men, overwhelmingly, it's mining. There's not a lot of professional um, middle-class positions going on here. And for women, it's um, domestic work, laundry work. So. Uh, you know, this gives you some pretty. This is a this is a very very working class existence and community. Not a lot of professional activity going on in the Irish community at this time. Um, for for U.S. born Irish, there's a little there's a slight difference. We begin to see the remnants of middle class professional. There's some clerks and engineers, and for women, there's some school teachers. So we begin to see the, the first glimpses of um, climbing the social ladder. Some domestics. Um, here, here, here's Mooney's um, stone. This is so ironic that the one, the one member of the Leadville Irish I, I so revere and highlight is, has a huge stone <laughs> in Los Angeles. And, and, um, yeah, and, and he, he was quite an interesting character. Um, this is in Calvary Cemetery in East Los Angeles. And he lost a son in Butte, who was just two. And he also lost a son, 21-year-old, in a streetcar accident in Los Angeles. So of his seven kids, he lost two of them. This is a map of just showing, pointing out where in Ireland they came from. Here's the Bear Peninsula. Alahees is at the tip of it out here. Some of them came from mining areas in Tipperary, in Waterford, in Mayo. Um, what's not on this map is a place called Cleeter Moor, which was a mining area in northern England. And many of the Irish miners went first to Cleeter Moor and from Cleeter Moor to Leadville. And the reason that we know that is that there's a place in East Leadville called Cleetermore Gulch. 
and in the and in the records, there's several dozen listed as being born in Cleetermore. So there's so we can see these these networks of these migration networks of Irish mining families that um, like stepping stones. And another one of those um, places is um, up in the Adirondack area. You know, since since we're here in Albany, I, I should mention this. Up around Port Henry, um, I believe it was lead mines up there. I could be wrong. Um, many of the Leadville Irish were born in that area, uh, Irish Americans, and so there was a definite connection to those mining regions up there. Of course, the anthracite region, the copper mining in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, lead mining in southwestern Wisconsin. These are all areas where many of the Irish mined first before heading to Leadville. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll read this quickly. This is a speech Moody gave. It gives you a, a little bit of a, a glimpse into the, um, the mentality of the strike. So I'll, I'll start a few lines down. We demand an increase in our wages from $3 to $4 per day and a reduction in our working hours from 10 to 8 hours. We think that we are acting right and that our demands are just. Every superintendent and foreman having agreed with us upon this point. Here we are today in a high altitude and living in the mines, breathing in the bad and stifling gases, with every danger of impairing our health and losing our lives. Not only this, gentlemen, but we have been denied the privilege of thinking and acting for ourselves into that which, as freemen, we are entitled to. Now we are told not to talk with each other while at work and are strictly ordered not to smoke. This is a small privilege, gentlemen, and God knows that living in continual candlelight is gloomy enough. Now we have just come to this conclusion that if they can pull the reins, we can pull tighter. And we are determined to have our rights no matter what comes. We can't stand this oppression, and we declare it right here. The amount of ore taken by each man in a day is sufficient to pay the expense of the month, as they are working 10 hours. Fair play is all we want, and that we will have. I love that line. If they can pull the reins, we can pull tighter. I think that speaks to every form of oppression <laughs> one can think of <laughs> and resistance. Um, and this quote, this to me speaks to 21st century immigrant experience as well. I don't know that the whole American flag covers me, but I think I have a corner. <laughs> and here's the Leadville Herald. The Molly Maguires must find a reservation outside of Colorado. Leadville drove the Chinese out, but admits Molly Maguires. The discrimination was a bad one. <laughs> um, another shot of the church with the rectory beside it. If you're ever in Leadville, they just restored the West Wall. This is a beautiful church. A, there's a mural of St. Patrick on the ceiling. This is the second version of St. Vincent's Hospital started by the Sisters of Leavenworth, Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth, Kansas. And they made their way to Leadville. You can imagine these nuns showing up at 10,000 feet in this godforsaken mining town and starting a hospital. And this, is this, this, this was built around 1900, it still stands, it's now converted to lofts. Um, I wouldn't want to live there given the stories of the condition these miners were in when they arrived. Um, Leadville still to this day has a St. Vincent's Hospital. So my bike tour from Dublin to Allahees was incredible. Um, I was fine until I hit the hills of West Cork. <laughs> and by the time I got to Allahees, I was ready for the stretcher. <laughs> yeah, and they, but oh, but it, but it was as if I was in paradise. The sunlight, the, the ocean, the greenery. I just, I was, I was just stunned at the beauty. I was around, I couldn't believe it. And it was the solstice, summer solstice. 
So I, I was 9.30 at night, it was 10 o'clock, it was still light. And I was greeted, um, met um, Tiggs Sullivan at the museum there. Um, you know, we, we, we agreed to work together on the twinning and <clears throat> made my way to um, O'Neill's pub. And I was supposed to meet two people at O'Neill's pub and then the whole pub paused, and I, I, I gave a presented to the whole pub, and then, then we started the singing. The singing went on for hours, from one one person to the next, um, singing songs of struggle and love, and it was beautiful. So, um, what's been really, you know, uh, satisfying to me and fulfilling to me is to know that people both in Ireland and in the U.S. are, are very impacted by this work and see the value in this work. And, um, you know, the, the people that we're honoring who were buried in those unmarked graves, um, most of them their families never heard from. They, didn't, they don't know to this day what happened to them. So it, there, there's a kind of closure, I think, that's going to happen with the memorial for many families. And, and we'll probably see families you know, bringing um, gifts and stones and everything else. So I, 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 I believe the memorial will be an international destination. And every time I give a talk, I, I end up being um, approached by someone who um, had family in Leadville, and they don't know what happened to them. So this is Diane um, Brisnahan, and she approached me after one of my talks, and her great aunt and uncle um, died at the age of uh, two days. And, she, and, and the family doesn't know where they're buried. So I went to the records, and actually I got her name wrong. Her name is O'Rourke. So I went to the records and looked up. Uh, there were no O'Rourke's, so I, I was giving her the, the bad news. And then I thought, I've done enough genealogy to know to drop the O. <laughs> so I, I went to the R's, and there they were in the records. Um, and uh, they, they were two days old. Um, one lived a day longer than the other. So she now, her family has that, that closure. I just continue to get emails about this. And that's been the that's been very satisfactory, although it takes a lot of my time. <laughs> um, there'll be a statue in the, in the center of the memorial of a, of a minor and a, um, a harp. Surrounding the statue will be um, all the 1,339 names on glass walls, and. Um, a spiral walkway will lead to the top of the mound where the statue is. We did a, um, well, once we identified where we wanted the memorial, we did a, we hired someone to do a ground penetrating radar study. And, and, and this was a part of the, that didn't look disturbed at all. I mean, there weren't any apparent graves, or, but, but he found about a dozen, what he, what he felt were, were likely remains in that area. And so that told us that there's so many more that we don't know that aren't in the records that were just makeshift. There are a lot of uh, just people who probably just took a, a friend or a loved one out and dug a hole wherever they could and they weren't done by the church. And so, so we had to move the memorial north to be certain that we weren't building over any graves. And it's been quite a, quite a journey, <laughs> quite an experience. <laughs> um, I'll stop there. I, I think I covered everything that I wanted to mention. Um, I'll, I'll say one last thing. Um, in 1896, 16 years later, the the miners struck again. There was a second strike that happened, and this was this was the Western Federation of Miners. The first one was organized under the Knights of Labor. The second one was organized under the Western Federation of Miners. Both of those unions were heavily Irish American. That strike, the wages were, 16 years later, the wages were still $3 a day. And this time they were ready for a long, long strike. They had resources. 
they they could outlast. They believed, um, but then the uh, the company began to import American-born miners from Missouri and reopen the mines in the Irish East Side, in the heart of the Irish district. They would put miners, and the miners would actually live there because if they strayed outside of the mine, their lives would be in danger because they were being they were replacement workers. So they were heavily guarded. So a splinter group of the union decided to try to take the mines back by force. And in the middle of the night, um, in September of 1896, they attacked um, the Coronado mine. And they had built a homemade cannon that they perched on a ridge to shoot at the oil tank. It shot chains. <laughs> And about 50 men were involved in this. The problem was the company had infiltrated the union and knew the attack was coming. So the guards were ready. There was a bloodbath. The official death toll was six. And that includes an Irish-American fireman who, when trying to put out the fire, was shot in the back and died. But the newspapers make reference to as many as a do as two dozen dead who were hastily buried along the railroad tracks to hide their identities. Um, so it's unknown, but that's that was another really important. That was the beginning of the decline of Leadville. The silver market in Leadville in Colorado sort of died um, when the um, Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed in the 1890s, and the population began to decline, and the Leadville Irish dispersed. They did what they had always done. They drifted. Many of them went to Denver. That includes Molly Brown and her family. Um, the Catholic parishes in Denver saw this infiltration of Irish, Leadville Irish money and, and, and people. The cathedral in East Colfax in Denver was built largely by Leadville Irish money. Um, and many went to Cripple Creek and Victor, which was the site of one of the last hard rock mining booms in Colorado, became a heavily Irish boom. And many went up to Butte, Montana, which was a kind of a safe haven for Irish immigrants and miners at that time. And that's really the end of the, the, the story of this incredible Irish community and 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 what they brought to colorado history and the effort to memorialize those buried in the cemetery so i'm going to stop and i i really hope that we can talk to each other and have some dialogue and some conversation thanks so much everyone for contributing and being here with us tonight in this beautiful night in albany along the hudson river <laughs> with my great with my great friends leslie and matt who have hosted me and and and, and took me off the the mean roads. <laughs> That's great. And, and another thank you to Elizabeth for on such short notice making this happen. So, okay. Thank you. Oh my God, that was I think amazing. Um, so many themes and topics raised. You know, it, it strikes me. Well, a lot struck me. But I, I was thinking how different the Irish experience on the West Coast, you know, was. Um, and to see, you know, so many concentrated from Cork or Mayo, and and the, the poor few little Kerry people <laughs> trying to eke out an existence, but you know, it, it goes to show you the the strength of chain migration back in the day. And you know, I think as Jim said, or as James said, every time I think certainly about even our mission here in the museum, you know, is is to tell the story of the contributions of the Irish in America, but just to encourage other groups to think about their place in the mosaic that is America. And so. You know, there really is so much that we have in common. You know, our 1850 ancestors have in common with people today who come into different ports and by different means, but often for some of the same reasons, you know, and we have to think about what kind of welcome they get and, and certainly, you know, what kind of welcome the Irish got in the day. You know, we do tend to sometimes glorify that up by the bootstraps, you know, sort of narrative. And at the end of the day, it was tough work. It was work that nobody wanted. It was building an infrastructure. There was sometimes not a guarantee of work. Um, and, you know, if you're coming malnourished already from the great hunger, then, you know, you're not going to make it. And so um, 
I thought, Jim, James, your work is amazing. You know, it's beautiful to be able to memorialize them and to have the names, you know, too often we don't even have names. And so to be able to tell the story of a voiceless, nameless population, I think is very, very important. And I hope, you know, that it will encourage empathy uh, for others who have experienced or, or are experiencing, you know, similar. So if anyone on Facebook or um, our crew here on uh, Zoom, I'm forgetting my vocabulary, <laughs> uh, have any questions or comments, please, you can unmute yourself here in Zoom and, you know, jump in or the Facebook people, I'll watch out for your typing. <laughs> Does anyone want to jump in? I thought it was interesting too, the women. Uh, we actually spotted it when you were put up the table, James, the, and I'm sure you guys saw too, you know, the proportion or the ratio of men to women. And, and of course, no, that's very unusual because almost always it was kind of 50-50 percent of immigrants, you know, coming out were Irish or were men and women and some years women outnumbered men, which we still find is a problem today. <laughs> um, but it was interesting that there, you know, they, the women are not maybe making it in as much uh, or as many numbers. So, uh, and of course, they're still doing the same work, keeping house, domestic servants, a few seamstresses. But and the other thing you raised that I love that maybe people want to jump in here, um, the labor issue. You know, the whole idea of not knowing who some of these amazing leaders were. We were talking before the event started about our own Kate Milani across there in Troy. Like not even a photograph exists of the woman, and she was the first national female labor leader in the country. You know, you think somebody would have had a photo of her somewhere, but and there probably is, but we don't know that that's her. You know, so. Um, it's amazing these kind of nameless lives, but they're really on the ground changing, changing lives, you know. Um, and I, I thought what you said too about the rains quote was amazing because actually what it struck me was look at how much they were willing to suffer. Like you pull the reins tighter, but we'll just pull tighter. And so there, there was no giving up, like there was no, and of course, you know, again, what were they coming from in Ireland had only prepared them. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something about that, um, Elizabeth, too. The, um, the ratio of men to women was about four to one. In, in the surrounding gulches, it was more like 10 to one. Yeah. And, um, but I want to emphasize, you know, my, my one issue with the memorial is I, I was pushing not to have um, an adult male minor as the statue because adult men are the minority of people buried in the cemetery. Um, and... Uh, one of the th things that I did find is that women did not take a back seat in these strikes. Mm. Um, they were actually, in many ways, more out front in confronting the guards and the soldiers than the men were. And there was an incident where, when the the soldiers would escort the replacement miners up to the mines, straight up Fifth Street in the heart of the, through the heart of the Irish neighborhood, and in one instance, um, Irish women went out and. They, they must have like formed a human chain. They blocked the road. And it was, and it was sort of, you know, you're not getting through. So um, a, according to a soldier's um, journal, these women hurled the most creative four-letter words, profanities <laughs> at these soldiers. We wouldn't that, know anything They had never them. heard before. <laughs> they, they, they made the same word into a noun, a verb, and an adjective. <laughs> <laughs> it's a prayer in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they didn't know what to do. The soldiers didn't know what to do. And it, and it, ended, in, and it ended violently. One of the women was, was wounded by a bayonet. So I think, I think it's important to, to kind of keep that in mind, the role that women played in these labor struggles. They didn't see this as, as their husbands and brothers and uncles fighting for wages. They really saw this as their community. Yeah. You know, fighting fighting for survival. So that that's important to be to be pointed out. And and the, the another question that we're we're really wrestling with is that not eight percent of the burials are listed in the records as stillborn. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to wrap our heads around what that meant in the nineteenth century. We, we of course know what it means, but um, in the nineteenth century context, mm -hmm. what what that meant and. Behind the um, red light district of, of Leadville was an alley that was known as Stillborn Alley. Mm. And so um, we also know that there's a section of the unmarked section that's almost all stillborn, that they were buried separately from uh, family. 
So, um, so anyway, we're, we're not quite sure how to talk about that yet. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this cemetery is like, lay, it's like the rings in a tree. Every week we get a new ring. It, it, it speaks to us in new ways. <laughs> You know, so I'll, I'll stop there. And, and so we have some questions. Well, a comment first from Jeannie. She said she was so glad that she tuned in. She's originally from Scranton, Lackawanna County area. And she said her um, Lynn and Walsh relatives, or Welsh as we say, spent time in the mines in Scranton. Her great grandfather, Lynn, died in the mines. And the story goes that they just threw him on the porch. She moved to Colorado then about more than 35 years ago. She said she's so glad that this recognition and monument is happening in Lendville. And Jennifer asks, do you have specific family names from uh, Mineville? Maybe she's Leadville. From Leadville. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so the 1330, you know all yeah, those. Yeah, we have yeah. all the, we have we have 1339 names and mm -hmm. from the parish records. Yep. So then there are other ones that we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we believe there's hundreds that aren't in the records. Okay, that's. We'll, we'll never know those names. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know what you were saying, the babies. In context of Irish Catholic tradition, it would make sense. God love them, you know. If they were, if they died before being baptized, they were not buried with the main flock, you know. So right. you're in uh, limbo. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and then we had a question on Zoom. Hannah says, "Are there other sites in the U.S. that you looked at to guide how this site would be memorialized?" Great question. Other sites in the U.S. besides Leadville? Mm -hmm. um, well, this has opened up questions about where there might be other cemeteries like this. Um, you know, Denver's old cemetery, Riverside Cemetery, the north corner of the cemetery, there are 6,000 people buried in un unmarked graves. Th those aren't sunken because the terrain and the soil is different. It just looks like a grass field. Um, and many, many, many of those are Irish immigrants. I've, I've taken a glance at the, at the surnames there. So uh, mining camps, and you can imagine many of these mining camps are now ghost towns. Mm -hmm. And there are there are likely um, cemeteries of unmarked graves that are completely unknown in, in the Rocky Mountains today that we're, I'm trying to, come, some of my students are working with me now, we're trying to identify some of those. Mm -hmm. so we think Leadville's the beginning, mm -hmm. and that what we're really talking about here is, um, is the famine didn't end in Ireland. Mm -hmm. it, it, it made its way to North America through the, the, the people, the traumatized migrants who made their who survived and made their way here and their remains are in many ways an extension of the famine and then we have to face that and come to terms with that and that's um that that, that as i think it also sort of is re remaking the narrative of the irish in the west there was this old narrative that the irish the farther west they went the, the easier life became mm -hmm. well the cemetery flies in the face of that <laughs> So my, my colleague in San Francisco, James Patrick Walsh the Elder, we call him. <laughs> I'm James Patrick Walsh the Younger. Um, he's written a lot about San Francisco Irish. Yeah. And um, we always, we, we talk about that a lot, so. And they're close-knit communities. I, I did work with a group uh, a little bit in San Francisco, but also in Oregon. And like every single person in Oregon was from um, do hollow like around the Canturk New Market area in Cork and it was the funny thing you know I listened to these oral history testimonies that they had given in the 70s so 1970s you know their people had left Ireland 100 years earlier and one of the expressions they used was um, the interviewer was looking for someone and, and the woman said oh he's gone down the town and we would say that in Kerry, where I'm from, but also, you know, this is just over the border in Cork. So I thought it was so funny to hear such a colloquial Irish, you know, dialect in Oregon 100 years later, you know. <laughs> um, so they're, they're tight-knit little communities, you know. Um, in terms of memorials, I was thinking, I, we spoke very briefly, James and I, on the phone about Duffy's Cot, which was a, a different kind of death, you know, and kind of a sort of a mass grave, uh, a, a, a nameless, certainly, grave of miners who possibly died in a, a cholera or yellow fever, or possibly were killed by the town and said they wouldn't pass on the disease. We're not sure. Um, and then the other one, I actually forget what the, I saw the design for the memorial, and it looks beautiful. It's in, I want to say, Montreal, or, you know, Quebec. It was to do with one of the um, famine uh, fever sheds. I think it might have been Montreal, and, and we did a whole series last year with our friends in um, Strokestown House. 
and they had just passed the design, you know, in the park. And it was a gorgeous way of, of memorializing the people. And the last one I'll mention about the famine is in, I think it's Sydney Harbour, the, the women, the, the girls that were kind of shipped out to become, you know, wives to men in, in the penal colony at the time, these girls that were shipped out from their homes, they've put their names on glass, but they're etched to sort of fade. And it's to show you, you know, these are sort of lost to time, even though we have the name. So there's loads of different, um, you know, designs that I think. And I like your idea of not having a, a male, no disrespect, to, <laughs> to, because it isn't really a minor memorial. It's a, you know, yeah, it's a community. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else, Jack or Bob, have you anything to chime in with? Or on Facebook, I'm watching you. It doesn't hate anyone else to type in a question there. I was just Is thinking, there any evidence, Bob, yeah. uh, Jim, Jim, that the, the wages increased as these people oh, on to the West? Looks like you're muted, John. Sorry, we're, you know what that is? It's my Facebook. Sorry, everyone, I'm going to mute my Facebook. <laughs> I just don't know how to do it. Okay, so say that again, Jack. Was there any way of knowing what? Uh, was there any indication that these people moving on to other mining areas uh, through their labor movements had uh, effected uh, an increase in wages? Uh, in Butte, yes. There, there was because the Irish. Some of the mines in Butte were Irish owned. The they they just had a better situation up there. And that's why one of the reasons Butte sustained through the 20th century. But but um, wherever they went, whatever mining camp they drifted to, they weren't going to find much much better situation. It was just a um, you know it was a situation where they faced this kind of catch 22, where if they stood up for themselves and they organized and they fought, they would face these harsh consequences. If they didn't stand up for themselves and organize, they had to swallow their dignity. And accept something that they knew was not fair. So um, I think that gets to that quote: "If they can pull the reins, we can pull tighter." It was almost like we'll go at we'll do anything, we'll sacrifice our lives for this fight. And I and I believe I, I think that's why Irish Americans today, who are really among the most educated and comfortable populations in the country need to see the importance of the labor movement. You know, this is the, the Irish immigrants were a backbone of the labor, early labor movement. Just, uh, they, they had, they had the, um, you know, they, uh, they, they had nothing to really lose by fighting. They, 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 they had to fight. So I think, I think that's, that's lost in some ways that connection to the labor movement and so important. In fact, the immigrant communities throughout American history have been the backbone of the labor movement. You know, Jewish immigrants, Italian immigrants, today um, immigrants from Mexico and Latin America and are, are fighting and struggling. And so I, I always emphasize to my students to see the, to see the labor movement as to see immigrant labor in, in its many generations and from many parts of the world. So. So educating Irish American students about the labor movement is fun for me because often they they have no idea, yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, you know, that Irish American students who who are you know heading to law school or medical school or whatever it is that their ambitions are. Well, it's only a couple of generations they have to go back before they find plumbers and construction workers and. Maids. And, yeah, maids. I mean, it's not far back they have to go to, to find those connections, but yet it's yeah. like a world away. And uh, and I think what this what we're doing here in this memorial for Irish Americans is we're is we're trying to ensure that that connection's not lost. You know, that connection between the, the privileged and the and, and the and the and the not privileged. So uh, the the visual of it does that. It really does. And Bob, did you have a question? It was more just of an observation. I thought that the, the slide with the sunken graves was just incredible. Mm -hmm. And just last weekend, our group, the Saratoga AOH, uh, was working to clear 
the first Catholic cemetery in Fulton County, New York, at the site of the first Catholic church. And there were some Irish there, was probably more German. There are about 90 graves that are out in the middle of the Adirondacks. Uh, you, you know, if you didn't know they, how to get there, you'd never find them. And it was interesting to see um, the last person actually interred there was uh, passed away in 1972. So that's the last time that there was really a working cemetery. So, but some, most of the graves are from the mid 1850s to the 1870s. There's one in Elizabeth, it was a woman, it said County Montross, which I don't know if that's one of the abandoned names of counties or merged names of counties, but yeah. that's what was on the stone. It said County Montross, Ireland, mm. um, last name of Gibbons. And there's uh, a place called Mantrasna, which is interesting in Mayo, Galway. It's on the border, I think. Uh, well, gee, I'm a historian, not a geographer, <laughs> but I think that's where it is. Mantrasna, you know. Yeah, um, it literally it literally yeah. says county. That, and I looked it up because I know that Ireland's mm -hmm. merged some names or, or merged some counties over the hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. But it was interesting to see that. The other thing that was interesting to see when uh, James, when you were talking about the, the children, um, there's, you know, there's these little stones in many cases for children and like they would put down the child's name four months and 78 days, that that's, that's, you know, that's how long that they had, they had lived. And, and I, I probably saw a dozen of those. And then, and the other thing, many of the graves were marked at one time, but the markers have been either destroyed or, or just worn away over time. But I think it really gives you a feeling for what's there. And, they dismantled the church um, and used most of the parts of it to rebuild it uh, next town over. But they left um, a small shrine to St. Joseph, which was the name of the original parish. But yeah, I mean, I, when I walked through there and when there was about 20 of us cutting trees down and mowing lawns and, and trying to fix it up again, it's year two we're doing this. And uh, you just, just get a feeling of, you know, there, there needs to be honor here and everybody seems to have forgotten about it. And, mm -hmm. and that's why when you put that slide up, it just really hit me. Mm -hmm. And as you know, James alluded to too in Ireland, you know, a lot of the famine graves around workhouses were empty kind of pits for a long time. And uh, it's, it is something that we are struggling with, you know, I guess at home and, and again, you alluded to the there's psychosis involved, you know, because of the malnourishment, there's alcoholism and, and all kinds of mental health problems that really, like scientists, have traced back to the famine that have kind of come down through generations. So um, there's an awful lot to unpack, you know, which is unfortunate. But I think um, this is great work they're showing. And it's very heartening. I mean, we've been supported by the Irish government too, that immigrant support program. Um, you know, as James said, they have an investment in the diaspora, you know, which votes living and dead, which I think is very touching, really, you know. Um, so it's great to see them support a project like this. And there probably many more coming. There will be many more. More come. And you guys on Zoom, are you okay? Well, I'll just say, Bob, thanks for sharing that. And uh, there's, you know, think about how many ce unknown cemeteries there are out there. But but that mining region up there in the Adirondack area by Port Henry, I mean, that hasn't been explored much, I don't, I don't believe. And and that's that's a, that, that was at one time a heavily Irish area. So hmm. if I if I lived in this region, I, I would definitely be up there, you know, looking around and seeing what I could find. Mm. So um, yeah, I think this that this memorial might do that. It might um, lead lead people to many other cemeteries that are that are waiting our attention. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I, I think if no one has anything else, we'll. Oh, hang on, who's happening here? Elizabeth. Yeah, <laughs> there's an echo. We do. We're in the same room, so I I mute mine, John, every now and then to ask a question, and then when someone else is talking, I I delete. There's always some kind of technical issues uh, when you do Zoom. So. I'll just say thank you to everyone for tuning in. If there are no other questions, we might finish up um, there at 8.15. Just a brief reminder, we're back on Sunday, technically live. We, we will be dry <laughs> by Sunday, I promise. Um, 
we're celebrating Yates Day, it's his birthday, and so two o'clock we're going to do some poetry reading and some there'll be a very short lecture, uh, not given by me, you'll be delighted, <laughs> and some songs, and then on, I'm looking at my calendar, we, oh, Brad Edmondson, the author we were having come on Monday, has had to change his talk, so we're not having that Adirondack talk on Monday night, it's pushed out to July, I'll, I'll change the date on, on Facebook for that, and then we are celebrating Bloom's Day on the 16th, and the one after that will be Ambassador Mulhall is going to speak with us on Zoom uh, about four Irish writers who visited America. So that will be on uh, Tuesday, whatever the 20-something is, Tuesday. So they'll all be Zoom. Uh, Bloomsday and Yates are live and in person, but we'll also put them out on Facebook. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Absolutely delighted to have Dr. James Walsh. I'm so glad I got the call. A couple of days ago, we weren't sure we'd be able to pull it off because the newsletter had already gone out. But thank <laughs> God we were free Friday and he was free Friday, so it worked. And uh, a little water never stopped the Irish. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for tuning in. And um, if there's a book, we'll get it. We Our copies came in today from whence I came, the, the talk we had on Tuesday night. And we have Republic of Shame, and now member Kaylin Hogan, the Irish journalist, talked about mother and baby homes. So our books are here. I'll, I'll ship them out to you all when, when you order them. So thanks very much. Good night um, to you all, James. Thank you very much. And our in-house audience, <laughs> who've been very quiet and well-behaved. So thank you all, and have a lovely weekend. Take care. <laughs>